today we're talking about a really exciting topic, uh, originality. And we have uh, two experts with us here. We have Professor uh, Alan Williams uh, from University of Surrey, and we have Professor Florian Koch from uh, Copenhagen Business School. And uh, the reason why we're offering this particular topic is because during our last webinar, when we invited um, reviewers uh, to talk about how to be good reviewers, and all three reviewers uh, on the panel agree that uh, originality is something that they look for. And that is a very important criterion when evaluating uh, manuscripts submitted to tourism management and other journals as well. So we decided to offer um, this uh, topic to, to have a, a, a deeper discussion. Um, so today, rather than a straight Getting into Q and A, we're gonna have um, our two panelists uh, share a little bit of their thoughts, and um, then we will open up the floor for for Q and A and discussion. So, uh, Florian, if you wanna share um, yes. your slides, um, we can have um, Professor Florian Cock to begin with a short. Um, presentation to give us some ideas what, what we're talking about. And then um, Professor Ellen Williams will follow up with a, a shorter presentation. Then uh, we will have a bit more thoughts and then we can have a more intelligent discussion afterwards. So Florian, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Kathy, for, for having me. Um, very important topic indeed, as you, you already uh, said. Um, I would jump directly into my short presentation. I keep it short, maybe around 10, 10 minutes, plus minus one, one minute on, on this topic. Uh, I call it the quest for originality. I think uh, we as researchers always look for originality, but oftentimes it's not really clear what is meant and what might be original for one review is not very original for, for another one. So my, my short presentation is intended to provide some input for the, for the following uh, discussion and also Alan's presentation. All right, um, let's just start with uh, what, what I have said in one of my papers, um, in paper called Developing Courageous Research Ideas, but you could also call it Developing Original Research Ideas. I, often use them as uh, synonyms. Um, what, what, what we found in that paper, or at least what, what our statement was, is that while more and more papers are published, the number of original courageous research remains considerably low. Because as I will also say a little bit later, originality is also often related to taking risks. It's about novelty and doing something new. And that of course is not, um, maybe the safest way to a publication, but probably what is needed, especially in TM and the, the other two leading uh, tourism journals. But it's actually not a problem um, that is limited to tourism or the social sciences. So I also put um, this, this little quote here. The decline of original research represents a substantial shift in science and technology. And you can see that is actually published in nature. So even nature uh, struggles with uh, keeping a level of originality that they, that they saw in the past. And of course, if we want to um, mention a third paper here, Alan, I have I have uh, not not um, put it on my slides, but of course, also in, in your paper with uh, Rodrigo Sanchez, you, you, you're, you're talking about originality, and that is what, what editors really, really look for, but they also complain that they do not receive enough original research. So that is just um, the, the situation we are in. And when we look into what actually is originality, um, I think I would not want to define it in order to narrow it or provide a delimitation uh, because it doesn't really uh, do this concept justice. Um, that's why I usually go with this understanding. It's, it can be anything, anything leading to the creation of new and important knowledge, right? So novelty is um, an important aspect here and important that relates to, to relevance and significance. We're not talking about these two things today, um, but of course people should care about it, right? And whether that is the academic community or tourism practitioners, that's another question. 
but that's usually what is meant uh, by creating important knowledge. So it exists on a continuum, at least for me. So some research is very original, some research only has some incremental originality. So there's a wide spectrum here. And I'm completely aware that not every paper has to reinvent the wheel and has to be radically uh, original. However, um, in order to make it into the, the leading journals of our discipline, of course, you should be more on the uh, one end of the continuum rather than the other. end. Uh, what is also important is that, and that probably already came up as as you said, uh, KP, in, in, the, in the last webinar, it's also subjective and fuzzy, right? And it's not really clear what is meant when a journal says we want to publish original research and it can mean a lot of things. So in order to narrow that down a little bit more, I have reflected um, and of course read through the existing literature. And these are a few ways or few types of originality. It can be a new phenomenon, for example, and I will touch up on that a little bit later. Um, I have published a piece in TM on uh, coolness. Well, you know, you can argue that coolness is not new, new. Well, but it has never been examined in the tourism or hospitality context. And we often talk about cool cities and the like. And examining such a new phenomenon could be considered original itself. A new question, right? It could be an ongoing discussion, but no one has really asked this question. For example, why do we go back to normal after COVID-19, although... Everyone has argued for a reset after COVID, that tourism has to um, reset and has to restart. Why don't we really see that? That would be an original new question. New theories, new framework, they do not have to be developed from scratch. They can also come from other disciplines. Right? I will briefly touch up on that a little bit later. Of course, new method can be original, new data can be original. And that already shows that what is meant by originality um, differs from discipline to discipline. And keeping in mind that tourism itself is a multidisciplinary field also make th makes this a little bit more blurry. For example, when we think about medical research, medical research is original when they have new data a new um, new sample and then they have new results which of course can be also original in itself and last but not least there can also be um, um, theories and assumptions that we have in our field that are challenged and that in itself can be considered daring and also original so what you can see is a lot of different types of originality exist, at least from my point of view. And whenever I start a new paper and whenever I discuss research with my co-authors, one of the first questions we try to answer is, okay, what is our type of originality? Because only if we understand what originality we develop in this paper can we also communicate it can we position the paper appropriately and being a reviewer for tm um i noticed that sometimes authors have not thought about this question right maybe there is not much originality in the research but maybe it's also not um articulated appropriately um and that can just this slide can maybe also just serve as a, as a starting point here and the last couple of minutes, I want to briefly introduce you to um, how I have tried to tackle um, the quest for originality in the past and my research endeavors. And one thing I developed is what I refer to as the OBC model. We also published this. That's why I make a quick re reference here. And I have um, that model included three main strategies, one called observe, the other bridge, and the third one is called challenge to come up with original research ideas. And I briefly walk you, walk you through them because I feel they provide pretty practical and hands-on guidelines for how do I achieve more originality in my research. And the first one is observe the world. It's not rocket science, right? Um, it's about observing an interesting phenomenon in the world. So you can see this already um, relates to the new phenomenon uh, type of originality. Scrutinize whether it also manifests in your domain. So this is the transfer you have to do here. And then argue who is affected by the phenomenon and how. 
Um, an example for that, I'll just mention that could be the coolness one. Um, there is not a lot of new um, method in that paper. Uh, even the theory you can, uh, uh, you can argue has been already developed in some destination image paper, in cognitive psychology, but it's mostly the new phenomenon that, that provides the foundation of the originality in this paper. And maybe just as a side note, this can also go the other way around. You can also write a paper about a tourism um, or hospitality phenomenon that you transfer to another context or that you make broader than tourism and hospitality. And that also works. And in the, the paper, I call this, this inside out approach, respectively the outside in approach. Um, the second one, which I found most useful in my um, research endeavors so far, is called the bridging. And that relates to new theories, to new frameworks, to new mindsets. And it tries to link tourism, which, as I said, is a multidisciplinary research field, to other disciplines. Because oftentimes, uh, very clever people in other domains have thought about a problem or, or a question that might relate to the problem that you are examining in your tourism paper at the moment. And I made use of that. I'm using all in some of my publications, a blend of biology and psychology, which is called evolutionary psychology. And I found that very refreshing. And I think it often resonated also with, a, with the editor and the uh, reviewer team when submitting that paper. And this is how you could um, um, describe it. Uh, bridging disciplines is the intentional effort to draw on the human theoretical, methodological, so you can also find new methods this way, and or empirical resources of a related discipline to shed new light on one's own discipline. And how exactly does it work? It starts with some investment costs, because you actually have to read beyond your discipline. Um, in my case, I, I often read these, these journals, even the the medical journal, of course, I do not understand every article, but sometimes it's a problem that we can also transfer to tourism or hospitality. And then they bring in a very nice new theoretical angle. And then when you um, develop that into a tourism paper, that is something you can consider very original. And of course, it does not stop with the reading, but you have to identify these mindsets and, and often in, in some cases, they should be able to explain the business phenomenon better than existing theories. And then you start with this recontextualization. So you have to um, yeah, develop some expertise in an area you are not an expert in. So you have to move out of your comfort zone. But I would say that in most of the original papers, they move out of a comfort zone, they move the reader out of a comfort zone. And usually when you read an original research article or manuscript as a reviewer, you can directly tell that this paper is original, right? So originality can be easily judged when you see originality. Well, you know why, but it's very hard to define because it's such a blurry concept. And last but not least, it's challenge. And I think I can just go over that very briefly because I, I talked about it a little bit before. It's about, yeah, challenging the assumption and theories we have and recreate in our field. I sometimes um, like to say a discipline, it's called a discipline because it also disciplines its researchers. We learn discipline in our discipline. And that sometimes limits our, our, our view. And sometimes we do not really see uh, other solutions to questions that we might have. And it's usually the opposite of gap spotting. Um, I don't have time to go more into that in detail, but there's a paper by Alveson and Sandberg who, who consider this a, a negative thing where you create a research gap and you really try to force your paper into that. Um, such um, papers usually directly advance theory. So this is the type of originality you're addressing here. And it also addresses the need for critical and innovative thinking. And we see that more and more in tourism research. For example, one a paper by uh, John Tribe in 2018 was explicitly calling for more critical, more innovative thinking. And maybe that is also uh, what we would like to achieve 
with this webinar tour a day, also uh, motivating you to take more risks uh, to develop original research. And how exactly does it work? Well, you identify central assumptions in your research field. You try to evaluate these critical assumptions. You develop alternative assumptions. And um, then you uh, conduct a conceptual evaluation and empirical evaluation of alternative assumptions. And I hope I was still on time, Kathy. Uh, thanks a lot yes. for your attention. Great, thank you. Thank you, Florian. Um, so I think the presentation sets a good start, uh, especially with the different types of newness um, we all need to think about and then um, challenge the, the theories and assumptions. Uh, you brought up the, a good point about articulation. Uh, very often we just assume people will understand what's new when we write up our paper, but um, the authors need to explicitly and strongly argue for or explain what's new about this research comparing to the previously published uh, research. Um, and then the OBC model. Uh, I think I think we all can relate to that. We just didn't put it in a in a nicely framed model. Sometimes we say just open your eyes, observe the world. But but I think yeah, uh, you uh, summarized that very nicely. So thank you, um, Ellen. You have um, some responses or additional thoughts to the presentation. Could you um, unmute? Yes. Can I check with you that I've shared yes. my screen? Yes. I have. Good. Well, um, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you, Florian, for uh, starting the discussion. Uh, I'm going to draw today mainly on two papers I've published uh, previously with um, some colleagues um, in Annals and JTR. Sorry, Kathy, not TM on this occasion, but... Uh, you can't publish all the good papers. I, 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 I hope that's the case. But the first paper I wrote with um, Isabel Rodriguez and Timu Makanen, and the three of us were innovation researchers. And so we came to the topic with the perspectives of innovation research. Now, innovation and originality are not the same, but there's a, a, quite a big overlap. And you can certainly get perspectives by looking over the fence from innovation at academic original research. So I'm going to make about three or four points uh, during the course of the um, this short presentation. Just give me one moment, please. Yeah, good. So... I'll try and avoid duplication, but there'll be a little bit with Florian. Um, but the first one is, what is originality? And I agree with Florian, really, that it is very, very difficult to pin it down in a precise utilitarian kind of definition. I mean, when we were doing our research uh, with editors and authors about originality, I mean, a, a very memorable quote from one of them was that I can't define it, but I know when I see it. You get that wow feeling. Um, in other words, it's an emotional uh, response that doesn't help you an awful lot, you know, when you're trying to work out originality in your own research. But, but that is where we are, I think. And part of the difficulty is that we know originality is about newness in some way. But what exactly or what degree of newness are we looking at? You know, it's like uniqueness. Everything is unique. Everything you write is new in some sense. But the question is, in what way? So in our work, we try to capture the idea of newness with this presentation you have here. You know, at the very top of a hierarchy, as it were, there's radical new research. What percentage is it? I don't know, but I do know it's extremely small. This is new to the world, or in our case, new to academic research. And that actually raises the old question, you know, is tourism a theory adopting or is it a theory generating um, uh, field of study. Well, it depends, what again, what you mean by newness, of course. 
Now, most researchers, um, I think, aspire to the next level down, major incremental research. And certainly, you know, if in most of our careers, the chance of being a really radical new researcher, let's be realistic, is modest. So it's aiming for that being a major incremental contribution uh, or in terms of originality. So what is it? It's new to tourism. It's partially challenging, substantially, but, but definitely partially challenging existing theories. It may be challenging the very parameters of our thinking. Um, and it's about adaptation. Again, something Florian mentioned, taking new theories, new ideas, new methods, but adapting them. There's always translation between contexts. So it's not just taking an idea and imitating it. And then below that, I, I guess, is the minor incremental. And that's probably what editors are most concerned about when they write about a lack of original research coming through. This is new to a specific tourism context, for example. It's already been done in ecotourism, but you're the first to apply it to BFR tourism. You've taken an existing model and you've changed two of the, uh, of the, the variables in it. All useful, but they are minor incremental. And essentially, it's not that they're totally unchallenging, but they don't significantly challenge existing knowledge. So that's, most of our research is underwater, as it were, as with uh, any glacier. But that is not to diminish its importance. You know, that major incremental research is really where the fundamental shifts in our research take place. So just before I leave what is originality, just to make one distinction, and that's between originality and contribution. You know, we often are asked um, by journals to explain our contribution. Well, it is originality in the sense of newness, but it is also something about quality. It's not enough to just have a good idea. It's about how you argue it, how you present it, how you validate it. And thirdly, it's about value or scope. You can have a wonderful idea and it influences the research of one other person, or you can have a wonderful idea and it changes research across the field of study as a whole. So contribution is different to originality. Now, how do you become an, or an original researcher? There's no simple formula. None of the elements here are, well, some may be necessary conditions, but they're not all necessary conditions. Some are just helpful conditions. But if we're trying to produce highly original research, then Florian already picked up on interdisciplinarity. He picked up on distinctive ways of seeing the world. He also mentioned challenging the world. And in terms of challenging the world, the individual researcher needs particular qualities. He or she needs self-confidence, self-confidence to face, not risk, but uncertainty, because with really new ideas, you are leaping into the dark, okay? which is there's very little guidance or limited guidance as to what will happen as you develop this idea and try to publish it. So you need confidence and competence to deal with those challenges. And you also need a personality that's seeking challenges, that's willing to take uncertainty, that's also persistent. Because if you get a great idea, it may not, you may not be able to work it out and communicate it effectively first time. Now, however, we look beyond the individual um, because really it is the case. No individual is an island in terms of producing good research, brilliant original research. You need also um, to be in or at least aware of what's going on in various kinds of networks, your own strong personal networks, but also weak networks where you may find more people with different ideas from you. 
and leaning across to them is a way of opening up new ideas. You need to be in an environment which tolerates a failure, which welcomes new ideas, where hierarchies are not too rigid and where young researchers and all researchers can challenge existing ideas and be encouraged to do so. So you need all of that um, in various ways. International experience helps mainly in the sense of you've looked over the fence at a different academic community, you've seen different ways of doing things. Not essential, but certainly helpful. And research funding, well, maybe yes, maybe no, because research funding um, will allow you to undertake some research you can't otherwise do and validate your big ideas. But at the same time, funders have short-term uh, horizons. And research funding bodies, in my experience, are very conservative. They don't like taking risks with, uh, with the funders' um, uh, resources. So we we'll have all of that um, to consider. Now, my last point, in terms of creativity, let's come back to the fact that most of us will not simply sit in a room and create an original research and publish it without working with others in some way. So you, we mostly, in, in quotes, let me rephrase that, we increasingly work in research teams these days. And even if we don't work closely to publishing teams, we work in networks. The literature on creativity tells us that the creative process is that meeting of divergence and convergence. Divergence is where you have someone who thinks differently within the group. This is the challenging individual. He takes everyone else out of their comfort zone. But it's not enough because for that idea to gain traction, to be accepted, you have to convince others of its value. And that's where the rest of the group provide a kind of validation process. So through negotiation, discussion, you discuss the original idea and you may modify it and you come to a convergence that here we have something of value. So that really is important. We have to work closely with people. So choose who you work with. You don't necessarily want them all to be exactly like you in their thinking. In fact, you don't. So finally, uh, number, my last point, you've got the idea, you've been through divergence and convergence, so how do you communicate it to the wider community? And if you don't communicate it effectively, your idea is going to be lost or it's going to be dormant until someone just rediscovers it X years down the line. So the challenge is you've got in your head tacit knowledge containing highly creative, highly original ideas. Now you've got to turn it into a codified statement of originality or contribution. So you've got to learn how to not only communicate your new idea, but you have to learn how to, how it is the logical extension of going beyond existing research. This is the challenging idea that Florian talked about. And I give you one example, um, and it's at the start of my career, structuralist theories were coming in. There was a big, big move, you know, to bring in these structural theories, and it was top down. People are bringing in big concepts, and it sounded okay, but it didn't really convince anyone very much until David Harvey, a very, very eminent social scientist, a geographer, I'm pleased to say. Um, did a paper in which he looked at housing problems in Baltimore. And he showed the, from that that he couldn't explain them with existing theories. And in the same paper, he took you on to why you needed alternative structural theories. So bear in mind that in communicating, you really have to show where you've come from as well as where you are going. And finally, before we get carried away with how original we all are, let me just remind you of something Schumpeter said in his late writings, when he said, ah, I'm not so convinced anymore about the importance of the, of the individual. 
The individuals are in some senses mechanisms. Of course, some are more original than others, but at any one time, there's a lot of people out there looking at theories in other subject areas, looking at the limitations of existing work. And there's a collective effort. And it's often one person who gets to publish first before the others. But it is a collective effort and they're sharing these ideas uh, at conferences online. So we have to acknowledge that the individual is part really of a collective pushing forward knowledge as a whole. And thank you for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you, Alan, for sharing these, these thoughts, especially uh, remember that we, we are in a community. Uh, it is important to have the dialogue and, and um, to bounce off ideas. I mean, yeah, put it this way. Um, Okay, let's open the floor for uh, q and A. I I have a question, but I will reserve that later uh, because we want to hear the, uh, the participants' question. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. Uh, Dear Professor Koch, I really like the way you suggest to think about the originality of the study and position it before writing. However, as authors, sometimes I, uh, I feel we are limited by the study itself, cannot see the bigger picture to position the study well to identify the more significant originality of the study. Would you have any suggestion to address this kind of problem? Yes, um, thanks a lot for, for the question. Um, to be honest, uh, uh, at, at least that's how, how I read this, read this question. Um, to be honest, I rarely start with the existing literature um, to develop new research ideas. I'm just, just very, very frank about this, because if I did, I think exactly this, this would happen. Um, that um, I might already adopt the mindset of the existing research, and that might make me, and or that would prevent me from looking beyond that. Um, so. When you, when when uh, it's asked, uh, I feel we are limited by the study itself or by the studies itself. Then I would say, well, don't start with a with a existing research. Don't start with the studies itself, but actually start with your idea. And only after that, I go into the, the existing literature. And then I do not really feel limited. Of course, what is true is um, that when we publish in in uh, journal outlets of course there's a limitation in terms of how much we can write what is the scope and scale of the journal but i would rather consider this not really as a as a handicap or as a challenge but just as another motivation to think even more carefully about what is the quintessential uh, a message of my paper and really condense it and really boil it down. And then usually I don't run into that problem. I hope I have answered that question. Um, otherwise, please uh, write to me afterwards or in the chat. Thank you. Um, I, I think last time we also mentioned about this. When we look at the paper, uh, uh, if you do a, a study by yourself, you look at it over and over and over, then you lose sight of the bigger picture. So it is always good to have somebody else take a look and give you some comments. And Alan mentioned about network, right? You have a, a close network and you have the wider network. So um, take advantage of the network. Um, that's what the reviewers are for actually, um, to take a fresh look. So before you submit the manuscript, before you complete a study, um, it will be very helpful to have someone else to, to take a, a fresh look and see, um, have you presented it clearly uh, very often we understand what we're talking about, but others may not understand that. Um, so, Alan, do you have any supplement? Yes, just a, a couple of quick points. One is mm -hmm. when you ask someone else to look at the paper, don't ask those who are closest to you. And I don't mean just because they're friends and they may not be sufficiently critical enough. You want the divergent thinkers or the people who will challenge your ideas, really challenge them, perhaps from a very conservative viewpoint because it may be a sign of what's going to come when you meet the referees, where you haven't yet developed the argument strongly enough to take the referees uh, uh, with you. That would be the first point. The second about 
moving between contexts is, um, this isn't quite answering a, a question, but I think there's a lot of value in, in working consistently across different contexts, not just visiting them. Because the problem with visiting is we tend to abstract theories and methods out of their context without fully understanding them. Um, for example, there's a paper I wrote on, on trust theories a while ago, and in it we commented about how trust increasingly appears now as a construct in so much behavioral research. But trust is actually a group of about many, many different disciplinary theories. And so if you're just taking constructs out of context without fully understanding them, I think you're not getting the full value when you translate them. So it, again, persistent work, don't just visit, work hard at understanding um, the different contexts you're working in. Okay, thank you. Uh, relating to the context, the next question came out of actually from our last uh, webinar. Um, the question of um, actually is for uh, for both of you. Both of you uh, touched um, on this topic a little bit in your presentation. Uh, Florian talked about new data and new results. Are those really new or original if it's simply in a different context? And then the iceberg presented by Alan, you were talking the middle level major contribution and, and you mentioned context as well. So I guess the question is, um, since we talked about this last time, the question was in a different context that not, does not necessarily qualify as original, then what about new data, new results? And then you mentioned about context in the middle, uh, middle area of the of the iceberg. Um, so Florian, do you want to go first and then Alan, you can follow up? Yes, sure. Good question. In fact, uh, I think to some extent, uh, Alan's um, iceberg metaphor can already explain it. I think uh, we, we clearly have to distinguish between level two and level three, right? A different context in uh, tourism, where it would be, let's say, ecotourism to, I don't know, different niche in tourism, well, that would just be a uh, recontextualization on the tourism level. However, of course, if you um, take uh, a method, a theory whatsoever that exists in a different field, let's say uh, human resources, and you bring that into tourism, well, you could consider that as a new context, but it's still original to tourism because it has not been examined in tourism as a, as a context. So zooming out. So I think that that answers half of the question. The other Half of the question is about new data and new results. Um, I, so one thing that is important to keep in mind is that these different types of originality can complement each other. And in most papers, you do not only have one type of originality, but let's say you have a new method that allows you to probably generate new results. And by doing that, you can maybe advance existing theory. So you would have tick three different boxes of originality in, in uh, that sense. Whether, let's say, new data can be uh, original enough, well, that really depends. If you have a huge data set that clearly shows um, how this intervention can make travelers uh, save 20% of CO2 when eating out, well, great. And then I would say, well, you, you have, a, have a nice foundation. But of course, new data, new results, they might probably be the weaker types of originality to solely rely on. You should definitely back that up with some of the other originality types. Yes, I mean, I, 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 I broadly agree with that. Um, let me give you an example. If someone brings into tourism a new idea X and writes a conceptual paper about it, launching this idea. And it's, and it's great, highly original within tourism. So major incremental in, 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 the, in terms of a diagram I suggested. But it hasn't yet been fully translated. I mean, someone then has to follow up that paper. And, and maybe it's not one, maybe it's several papers who try to operationalize this concept and complete the translation into tourism. It's the first person for example, if it's quantitative research, who develops a way of um, producing a new model into it. In qualitative, it might be a, um, just a, a different way 
of thinking about uh, how we interpret uh, uh, individual practices. But those are all original um, contributions to research and they need each other. I mean, and this partly goes back to what Florian was saying about combining different types of originality. So all of this is original, all of it is valuable. And even when you get to the very bottom of my glacier, there's valuable research down there, of course, but it's just that the value and originality are diminishing at that stage. But somewhere it's going to make a, make a useful contribution. So it really depends on what question you start from. Is it a question, how do I position myself in the major incremental area? Or is it, I have a problem I want to address. How do I address this problem and make a contribution? And you come up with different answers, depending which question you ask yourself. OK, great. Um, yeah, context. We very often see submissions. Um, and then the reviewer reviewers will say, oh, oh this has been done in another discipline, and this is just a replication of the study um, using hotel or tourism as a context. Therefore, it is not original. Um, I think that type of paper usually, um, usually what we see is, you use a, a theory without modification, without enhancement. You use existing measurement skill without, again, adaptation to the specific um, characteristics of the tourism or hospitality industry. So, so you simply copy something, paste it here, go out, collect data, run the statistics, and report a finding. Uh, if that's the only thing that's new context without changing every, anything, then I think that's what the reviewer's comment uh, was about. It's simply using things already known in other disciplines and simply changing the context. Uh, that would not be considered original, but that's not what you two are talking about, right? <laughs> Do you want me to go first, sure, Florian? Sure. Please, no, please go ahead, Alan. Um, I mean, to me, it's all original because it's all producing something new. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's different levels of significance. Um, and, and some of it I would want to publish to bring to a wider audience in, in, in a world where there's limited publishing opportunities in top journals. And some, of course, you know, with a referees, I would say really an, it, interesting, but not sufficiently new and original and scope to be published uh, in, in a top journal. So when I don't think we can say that the work which moves across and repeats the theory and method is not original. It just has limited original okay. originality. Good point. Gloria. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I fully agree with, with Alan. That would, what you described, uh, Kathy, is at the, yeah low end of the of the originality continuum but um it's important that you that you highlight that also to to eradicate some some misunderstandings here right i think when we bring in new theories new mindsets new frameworks from other disciplines into tourism it has to be really clear how um the the author team has yeah tailored worked advanced the original theory that they may be found in marketing um, to yeah, fit the, the idiosyncratic uh, nature of uh, tourism. Because otherwise, indeed, a reviewer could criticize, well, why do we really need another paper, especially in TM, such a leading journal, that is more or less a replication. Tell me what is special about tourism and tell me how you transferred, right? Transferred the theory and the importance is between adopting and adapting, right? That you don't just copy paste it. Well, that's that's not original, but you use that as a starting point. Okay, great. Um, yeah, it, it, you brought out a good point. Uh, it's, it's incremental and uh, knowledge creation could be empirical knowledge or it could be theoretical knowledge. Some journals are positioned to publish empirical knowledge uh, in, uh, but others are, are more positioned as uh, advancing theoretical development. So, um, yeah, different journals will have different um, 
different uh, evaluation criteria, I suppose, right? Um, any of the participants would like to turn on your camera and ask a question face-to-face? Uh, -face? Uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, another question I often get asked is, um, this is a completely new concept, new topic no one has ever talked about. Then you're criticizing me for not having theoretical underpinning, theoretical support. Um, is that a valid um, argument? Or if, if you're really doing something really nobody has ever done before, how can you find theoretical support? Well, I would, I would, I would give such a such a, a paper definitely more leeway here, right? I would accept, let's say, a thinner theoretical foundation. Um, I can just tell you what I did in this PM paper on coolness, because research on coolness um, has only emerged over the last couple of years, and it was never really considered an academic research field. Um, so, of course, in 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 this case, um, I. I zoomed out and tried to find um, theories, especially in this case from psychology, that were not about coolness at all, but mostly cognitive psychology. Zooming out, finding good theory in cognitive psychology, and then bringing it back to tourism to yeah corroborate my my point. So that that's what I would expect. Although there's no particular research on coolness, well, you can always find. Um, such theories, because in the end, you can consider this to be an attitude, and obviously there has been research on on attitude. Of course, it can also support it with um, exploratory qualitative research. If you don't know what it is, well, ask, ask people what they think is cool, ask people what they think is or original, and then you can, of course, use that as complementary evidence to the, to the more um, fundamental theories that you brought in from psychology and, and, and other disciplines. That's how I would go about it. All right, thank you, Alan. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think you know, all research has somewhere in it theory, you know, it's explicit or implicit. So I think it's important to bring that out and not just to say it's empirical uh, research. Um, the, the, and, and because of that, um, I also agree very much with Florian that it's a case of being more tolerant, uh, no, so, wrong word, of being more accepting that the theoretical foundations of this new work are still tentative or rather thin at this stage. And that a, poses quite difficult issues, I imagine, for editors, you know, because it's not just the authors taking risks, but editors also have to take risks about what they think are going to be significant contributions and will be looked back as high quality papers uh, in five years time, for example. The point about theory um, is, that, although, is that we should, wherever possible, try and make it explicit, because ultimately it's the theories that allow us to bridge between context and, and bridge between empirical research. If, so if we want to get beyond the immediate study, ultimately, we need in some way to come back uh, to theory. Okay, great. Yeah, um, there must to be there must be a a theoretical component to it, with, just from other discipline, uh, and that's what Florian was saying, interdisciplinary. Um, it's new for tourism. There must be something out there in this world that you know can provide some theoretical uh, underpinning to it. Um, and, and Alan, your point about um, um, there must be some theory um, in order for us to say this is beyond this specific context in terms of empirical evidence, right? Theory provides that, um, provides that um, support, I suppose, for the ability to generalize beyond the, the study context. Yeah, two things, Kathy. One, it allows us to generalize beyond the context. But also, I don't really think, you know, that there's anything that's just empirical research. You know, there's always hidden somewhere in the background some kind of theoretical view of the world that influenced what questions we asked, what data we went out and, and collected. It's, a lot of the time, it's not explicit. 
but it is there. And it's, we need to look at that because that's partly actually what then leads you to being able to think of move towards originality. When you say, oh, hang on, I, I have been asking the wrong questions here. Yeah, yeah. Um, our time is up, but there are a couple of questions. I just run through them very quickly. So either one of you have an answer, uh, you're welcome to jump in. Um, I've seen quite a number of papers where the author simply improve on existing theories in the tourism discipline. Uh, where would those be positioned in terms of or originality? I suppose that refers to the different types of originality you're talking about, Florian. Yeah. Um, yeah, of course, when it's about... Um yeah improving existing theories in the tourism discipline of course you can improve by challenging what what our assumptions are of course that's that's a more radical thing then you could of course claim you improve the theory by challenging some of the the um uh the, the assumptions underlying it um of course when you when you um take a new theory in uh, from another discipline, well, may, sometimes we use theories that we have borrowed from other disciplines, and then they are, um, yeah, enhanced, developed in other disciplines, but also in our disciplines, and then we actually send them back to those disciplines. I see that more and more and more often. That is also then then picked up by by other disciplines. So I can also see that as as theory development. So most in the theory um, model side or on the challenging side. Yes, and then there's another comment. Um, I think I always use theories from sociology and social psychology to study tourist behavior. However, most of theories in sociology is under the background of mundane life rather than tourism life. How should we transfer these theories into tourism study to represent the frequent time space changing? Alan, do you, do you want to respond to that? <laughs> yes, yeah, no, no, it's fine. Yeah, thank you, Florian. Um, I think you took the harder question, so I'm pleased yeah. to take uh, this one. Um, certainly on sociology, which, is, which I, I'm closer to than social psychology in some ways, um, I have a short answer. Look at the mobilities research of uh, that started with people like John Arry, which is all about getting away from the idea of static views of society. And it's also about the interconnection of mobilities from different areas of people's lives. So to banal every day, the exotic tourism, um, all become intermixed. And indeed, we start challenging the idea that one is exotic and one is banal. Um, so for sociology, I can't see a way forward. Look at the journal Mobilities, for example. It's full of rich insights for tourism researchers. Yeah, I think because the tourism is different from everyday life, and that makes great, um, I would say context. I, I try to avoid the word, but it make it creates a great new phenomenon for us to further develop those theory, modify that for for the discipline of tourism, and many other disciplines now have, uh, again, like uh, Florian said, uh, circle circle that those theory back to the the original discipline, learning from the. Uh, from tourism as well, right? So um, yes, certainly the, the discipline tourism uh, studies have gained uh, reputation among the general um, social sciences and, and beyond in terms of uh, theoretical development and knowledge creation. So, um, okay, our uh, time is really um, approaching the end. I would like to thank uh, Professor Florian Cog and Professor uh, Alan Williams for spending uh, your precious hour with us today.